Welcome to the Mulatto History Channel. The Mulatto History Channel is dedicated to sharing and exploring Mulatto history around the world. So tune in and enjoy the history lessons that I share with you on this channel. The Mulatto History Channel is dedicated to sharing our history, our story, and our voice. So for today's discussion, we're going to be talking about Juan de Perea. Juan de Perea is a mulatto man or was a mulatto man, a Spanish painter. As you can see here from the Wikipedia from the 1600s. Starting out, you know, this obviously this channel is for the promotion of mulatto people, not only in America, but around the world. So, of course, all people and nations can benefit from the information that is shared on this channel. Now, we use this channel to promote and uplift mulatto people by connecting our rich history to our current circumstances while advocating for our collective plight. We promote mulatto coupling. We see each other as men and women together as something that is natural and beautiful. We promote ourselves and uplift each other while pursuing to develop an organic community with each other. And of course, we are the future. So diving right into this, right? Juan de Perea is uh, circa 1606 in Antiquita, uh, uh, through, uh, 1670 in Madrid. Okay. So was a Spanish painter born into slavery in Antiquera near uh, Malaga, Spain. Yeah, he is known uh, primarily as a member of the household and workshop of painter Diego Vasquez. So this is kind of, I guess you can say his master per se, because um, obviously this was, as we read on, this was kind of a slave master relationship. Um, and so the, I guess obviously a apprentice, you know, um, situation, you know, like a master or apprentice, um, which kind of, you know, th these titles definitely were were very prevalent during that time and actually transitioned, you know, from this kind of uh, this system of labor that they've had where actually painting was obviously a well known profession and in this era in Europe. But this whole concept of being an apprentice where this man, uh, Juan de Prea, essentially learned from this gentleman um, how to paint. Or obviously, if he's, he's had skill sets and talent, natural talent, um, beforehand, but definitely um, under the tutelage, as we can see. So, um, who freed him in 1650, okay? Um, so, the last 20 years of his, uh, of Juan de Prea's life was as a free man. Um, his 1661 work, The Calling of St. Matthew, sometimes also referred to as the Vocation of St. Matthew, is on display at the Museo de Prado in Madrid, Spain. Okay, so he's known for a paint, uh, painter, uh, it's known for this painting, and then, okay, Baroque, which is the movement Baroque, which is like a period of like uh, style music. Typically, when I hear Baroque, it's in reference to classical music and it's like a European. So it says here, Baroque is a style of architecture, music, dance, painting, sculpture, poetry, and other arts that flourished in Europe from the early 16th century, uh, seven, excuse me, early 17th century until the 1740s. In the territories of the Spanish and Portuguese empires, including the Iberian Peninsula. So the Baroque is kind of the fashion style, so to speak, the art of the European culture. Definitely with art, paintings and music for sure 
and going, going right into his biography. And this is obviously a short wiki. So I'm going to share some art gallery, uh, some some uh, paintings of his and go into a couple videos and then I'll be done for the night. But definitely happy to be here. So biography, Juan de Prea was a Spaniard born into slavery in southern Spain, probably an Antiquera. A little difficult to pronounce the Spanish in Magala province. You can see here in the map, kind of the most southern tip of Spain. As you can see here, it's almost like it's touching kind of the Morocco uh, North uh, North African, North African continent here. But yeah, definitely. Um, province around 1610. Little is known on his background, although Antio Palomino, Palomino, excuse me, describes him as a Morisco uh convert from islam uh being of mixed percentile and unusual color <laughs> his quotation uh the first known reference to juan pereira as a painter is in a letter addressed to pedro galindo attorney of the city of Seville, written on the 12th of may 1630 in which juan de prea requests permission to move to madrid in order to continue his studies together with his brother uh Hespe the authenticity of this document is questioned since within it he claims to be a free man and does not once mention Velasquez. It is unknown at what time he began serving Diego Velasquez. This is Diego Velasquez. Uh, I think it was actually highlighted here. Apologize guys. It is unknown at the time he began serving Diego Velasquez, this gentleman here. In 1642, he signed as a witness in the in a power of attorney for Velasquez in a lawsuit against scribes in a criminal court. He was also a witness in October and December 1647 for two other powers of attorney to manage his assets in Seville, granted by Velasquez and his wife, Juana Pachico. He would again sign a similar document in 1653 for Francesca Velasquez, daughter of the painter. In 1649, he accompanied Velasquez on his second trip to Italy. This is where Velasquez painted his famous portrait of Juan de Perea, currently in the Metrop uh, excuse me, Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York. The painting was exposed in the Pantheon of Rome in March 1650 during the festivities of honor of the patron of the virtuosos of the Pantheon, which Velasquez had recently joined. On the 23rd of November, while still in Rome, Velasquez granted him a letter of freedom, which would come into effect after four years on the condition that he did not escape or commit any criminal act in the period. The document of his manumission discovered by Jennifer Montago, Montago uh, is held in the Archivio di Statio. <laughs> it's in Rome. It's Italian. The Archive of the State of Rome, essentially. From then on until his death in Madrid, he worked as an independent painter demonstrating knowledge acquired in Velasquez's workshop, mm -hmm. where he likely had wider responsibilities than Palomino suggests, as well as as his knowledge of various other Spanish and Italian painters. Yeah, so he definitely acquired a lot of knowledge in a workshop working there as far as, uh, you know, um, all the techniques of art. I'm not an artist per se, um, but this is the painting. This is done by Velasquez that who painted, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but his, you know, quote, slave, essentially, his mulatto uh, apprentice, I guess would be uh, in better terms. But this is definitely him here. And so we can go into little details about him, this gentleman, his art, some of his uh, work, which is detailed here. So let's check it out. So for reference, this is a portrait of Augustin Moreto. This is a uh, more Moreto. This is 1648. This is the I guess the circa. This is the um, the time period, I guess, expected. Right. If they have the actual museum of. Yeah. I don't know. Let me know in the comments, you guys, what you guys think about art. If you are an art, I've been to several art museums in Los Angeles, um, in San Francisco as well. California has a lot of great um, art museums. I'm more of kind of a historian, so I definitely like more like artifacts per se, 
I like to learn more about the history and geography. So Washington DC is definitely a great city for a lot of the museums. They have the Smithsonian Institute. They have a whole collection of museums. Um, and uh, they definitely were kind of more history based uh, artifacts, so to speak, versus like the places in California, a lot of them were art galleries, like the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles um, and stuff like that. But so I've been to a few, I've been to several, I should say museums in the United States of America on both coasts, um, but I'm not really an art uh, aficionado per se, but I do appreciate the, the art for sure. But I definitely am more intrigued by the kind of historical relevance of a, a lot of art and stuff. So yeah, moving on to the next one, you know, very interesting work here right now this is uh, for reference portrait of a monk okay this is 1651 hermitage museum is where this is held and here we have the flight into Egypt, 1658, John and Maple Ringling Museum Art, and this is in Florida. Okay, I think I've seen this one referenced somewhere. El Batismo de Cristo, Museum de es del Prado, I'm not sure. This could be in Spain, I believe so. That where the museum, where this, uh, portrait is held at but yeah obviously you can tell by looking at this picture here who is that you know but definitely during the time obviously a lot of the artwork is referenced based off biblical because that's kind of the theology of the day right especially in spain um most of europe definitely how theology how the religious kind of order catholicism and then christianity plays a huge i mean the the whole role of life of life and death basically so that's where kind of the discussion is kind of centered around this individual here right but then of course these individuals here right you can see here obviously who is that who is that and then who is this and then you know obviously how angels are typically, you know, I mean, I've seen a lot of reference depicted as, you know, babies, essentially, or children. And then obviously the wings here, you can tell. So just very interesting artwork. And then here he has like the staff, um, the seashell. So what do you guys think? And obviously the, the sheep here reference kind of looks like a, in the back here, like a um, baptism is taking place, the water being kind of anointed. I guess this could be reference to being anointed as well than a like a, bird, a dove shedding light interesting to see what this structure of the building is but yeah just kind of gazing upon this right and you know but definitely interesting very interesting stuff so moving along to the next one this one is the portrait of jose rates dalmo Museum in uh, Valencia, that's in uh, Bellis Artes Valencia, that's in, in Italy. And he has here this, yeah, so he's a navigator essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, I think I've seen this reference as well, another um the calling of saint matthew yeah 1661 prado museum definitely yeah these images definitely um like obviously when you see this the gentleman here we can kind of guess who this is here typically a lot of these paintings and images with this gentleman here definitely is uh well known in a lot of regards people have you know paid a lot of attention to it but yeah very interesting cool
My name is Julie Maratu, and I'm a painter. There are certain paintings that stand out in the gallery that call you to them. Even with all the other Velasquez works in that room, this was one of the paintings that has always haunted me. It's a big marker for me to me. The portrait. So I went back and looked up some of the narratives around this painting. One being that Velasquez spent a few years in Rome preparing to make the portrait of Innocent the Tenth, and Juan de Preo de Velasquez at the time was with him. He was one of his primary assistants, and he was his slave. I read this because I was thinking, how do you paint your slave? You know, American slave narrative is very different, but this is a person who did not have his rights himself. There's such irony in that setup. The fact that Velasquez could capture complex emotions that comes from his own position as the owner of this person and what that denies that person is standing there very dignified and slipping up his hand under his bra pulls you to that part of him just under his heart the hair falls back into the background and gives the illumination of the face and his radiance and you come up closely and you look at the way the brush strokes articulate the lace on the shawl and try to look at these things gentleness of the brush on his face, his hands, his mouth, his lips, his nostrils. He's almost holding a breath. You feel like you're encountering a real human being. To be able to capture this complete humanity of someone you think of as not completely human on the same level as you, there's an incredible contradiction in the world you know and talk about. I think of the political implications of painting a black man with copper skin and brown eyes, and then there's here's the now that right there is what definitely stood out to me so let me just roll it back we could take a look at this lady here this is a mulatto woman herself okay now how she describes the man she describes the man as a quote black man right which i don't agree with this is a mulatto man Okay, so Okay, so she said he uh he's a black man but with copper skin and brown eyes. So yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. So the whole idea is is like I said, you're considered black historically when there's certain people, certain demographics who can kind of claim your wins, right? When it's beneficial this gentleman does not look like a black man to me. He definitely looks like a mulatto man, a man who is mixed, who has European and African ancestry that complements each other, of course, looking at his phenotype. But I just, I'm going to continue to play this clip and then obviously talk a little bit about it. And then there's, here's the emotion. It's not contempt. I don't read it as rageful or angry. And it's not resignation. But this very conflicted, implicit sadness in that human being described within that dignity. There's honor in being painted by someone such as Velasquez. But on the other hand, Juan de Breja was also a painter in his own right, from what I read. And in one narrative, Velasquez freed him to follow his work. In another narrative, Velasquez didn't actually want him to paint. And he painted secretly without Velasquez's knowledge of it. So there are these competing narratives. Those are also fascinating. I mean, who knows what the narrative actually is and what the intention was with the portrait, but the fact that it wasn't for years after this painting was made that he was freed. Looking at his expression, I'm grieved, almost to tears. That's not often a painter can do that. It's hard to give language to that experience that happens when you're in front of a work like this, and it feels so alive. When you walk back from it, and his eyes get hazy. I leave, and I still see his face. This lady, uh, Julie Moretu, is an Ethiopian-American con uh, contemporary visual artist. So her perspective was definitely going to be unique because this is her profession. Her craft is art. Um, but obviously, I believe her mother is a Caucasian. Or no, let me see. Um, yeah. The daughter of American Montessori school teacher and Ethiopian college professor embodies uh, multiple identities. Uh, she's Ethiopian American. She's half black. You guys see that? Ethiopian American. She's half black. 
but she identified Juan de Perea as being quote black, you know, so with copper skin, of course. So it's just, it's just interesting. I think it's just interesting to see, you know, how other, you know, so-called mixed people or mulatto people, how they identify things and how they see the world. Obviously she's a visual artist there in itself. A visual artist means how she sees, sees things are definitely going to be unique in its own right. But I'm always open to hear other people's unique perspectives. I'm just tying this story into kind of the mulatto history of who we are and our, our culture identity. And definitely that we've been around for years. We definitely are solidified. Hey, what's going on? Good to see you. And then again, the name, the title of my channel, Mulatto Vanguard. Obviously, we understand the word mulatto is uh, kind of a, you know, censored word, so to speak. It's literally labeled as offensive in which YouTube is, is Google. So with that in itself, they're essentially going to make efforts to censor our speech, you know, censor the, the title and what we stand for, except, ex you know, basically for sticking up for our group, right? Advocating for ourselves, our own unique uh, designation. And we've always, we've had a designation which was, you know, stolen from us with the 1924 Racial Integrity Act. I'm speaking here in America. Other countries, things might play out a little differently. Um, but, you know, it's pretty interesting. So you say here, you say, I can see people reporting you is not a dirty, yeah, it's not a dirty word to me, but I've said like, and, you know, there's a lot of older mulatto people who kind of are very fickle about it and who don't like it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, this weekend. So that's what I've noticed too in America. Some of the older cats definitely kind of, you know, you know they think they know it all, but they don't, they don't seem to like the word. And um, a lot of the younger people are embracing it, which I do appreciate. And that's definitely what I'm, this whole channel is for. It's kind of for the younger crowd, the younger audience, the, the Z's, so to speak. I'm a millennial. So I'm definitely speaking to disease to kind of formulate, develop a cohesive network and to stop being mules and, you know, utilities for other people to have your own purpose, your own agenda and collectivize based on that. So I'm definitely happy to do that. But yeah, I mean, the word, you know, people refer to it as being archaic and it's a bad word, you know, and all this stuff. It ties into colonialism, et cetera. But the whole concept of being white or being black is directly tied into colonialism. So those words are just as bad as the word mulatto if people want to go there. Um, but that's a whole nother discussion. I just want to share the, our history with you guys. So, so definitely I'm happy to do that for you guys. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm here to serve you guys. This is all for you. It's for all of us here. I think a lot of people are scared of being canceled. Trust me, I am scared sometimes too, but you give me confidence to reclaim a model identity. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you for being here.